Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Today's a good day. Because we're watching Epic History TV. Preemptive like. Original link to the video, top of the description, below that link to the Discord. I have the hiccups, and... It is very annoying. Um, listen, if you are not ready to learn, you are in the wrong class. Home ec is down the hall. Make me a pizza. Pizza. Phones away. We are watching an amazing channel. Probably my favorite channel. Uh, let's go. Did I say all the things? Original link, top description, Discord below that. My name is Connor. I like to learn. Let's go. Phones away. Even if you're watching on one, throw it. 1805. Britain is at war with France. Let's go. The French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte will soon dominate mainland Europe. But at sea, Britain's Royal Navy reigns supreme. That year, Napoleon wins one of his greatest victories against the Russians and Austrians at Austerlitz. I had to shut off the TV. That year, Napoleon wins one of his greatest victories against the Russians and Austrians mm -hmm. at Austerlitz. But six weeks earlier, off the coast of Spain, the British win a battle of much Trafalgar? more lasting strategic significance. Off Cape Trafalgar, the Royal Navy inflicts a crushing defeat on the combined fleet of France and Spain. Enemy losses are devastating. British naval superiority will not be seriously challenged again for the rest of the war. Britain goes on to play a leading role in Napoleon's eventual defeat. Its greatest contribution, its wooden walls the Royal Navy. Britain is the world's largest naval power. With 136 ships of the line and 110,000 men at sea. Do you guys think that the British were the most significant uh, opponent to uh, 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 the French and Napoleon like in the entirety of the war? Of the line and 110,000 men at sea. Yeah. The Navy protects the homeland from invasion. It allows Britain to project force into Europe with raids and expeditionary forces. It cuts off enemy trade while protecting Britain's own. It isolates and seizes overseas colonies, including the vastly profitable sugar islands of the West Indies. It undermines enemy economies while allowing Britain to use its own financial strength to sustain its allies. What was, what was the U.S.'s view on the Napoleonic Wars? I know we're, it was a very baby country at the time. And obviously the War of 1812, which was like 1812 to 1815 or something, um, where we fought the British and you guys burnt down the freaking White House. I don't, I don't, I, I didn't forget that. But were we more sympathetic towards France than, than the powers against France? In two decades of war with France, I gotta shut Britain up. wins a series of naval battles that ensure it can carry out these war-winning strategies effectively. Among the Royal Navy's most formidable warships, HMS Victory, a first-rate ship of the line, the most powerful class of warship afloat. 104 guns, 820 men. A single broadside from Victory packs more weight of iron than every gun in Wellington's army at Waterloo. This is Epic History TV's guide to a legendary Napoleonic... So it's basically like a giant floating shotgun? Warship. Epic TV's guide to a legendary gotta... Napoleonic warship.
This video is sponsored by Fabulous. The number. Guys, make sure uh, to use the uh, slash Epic History TV. Please use their link. Okay. Number one self care app that helps you build better habits and achieve your goals. Some struggles many of us face on a daily basis staying focused, dealing with stress, getting enough sleep. With more of us now working from home or relying on ourselves for inspiration and motivation, healthy routines have never been more important. Fabulous is here to help. Based on behavioral science, their app works like a digital life coach, gently encouraging you into daily habits that over time will leave you feeling healthier, more focused, and more productive. And it has some wonderfully produced videos to help you on this path. Fabulous is tailored to your specific requirements. Choose habit tracking to embed great routines into your daily life or journeys to work towards your specific well-being goals over several weeks. We've been using Fabulous for just a week now and already have been able to add various healthy habits to our morning routine. With a Fabulous Premium account, you can build and improve an unlimited number of habits and take part in all their programs and exercises. Start building your ideal daily routine today. The first 500 people to click on the link in our video change. description will get 25% off Fabulous Premium. Thanks to Fabulous for sponsoring this video. Thanks, Fabulous. Today, HMS Victory lies in Dry Dock in Portsmouth. I gotta on go England's see it. South Coast, a famous visitor attraction and the world's oldest commissioned warship. She's a remarkable survivor from a vanished world of sail-powered warships and global struggles between Europe's great empires. Victory was built to boost British naval power at the height of one of these struggles, the Seven Years' War. Construction began at Chatham Royal Dockyard in 1759. She was designed by Sir Thomas Slade, the foremost British naval architect of the age. Around 6,000 trees went into Victory. Most were British oak, though her lower masts were originally New England pine. Her keel was elm. Her upper masts and yards more flexible fir and spruce. The result, launched in 1765, was soon considered a masterpiece. A ship bristling with firepower, with the speed and handling of a much lighter vessel. My last comment, okay. In my opinion, shipbuilding, once iron and, and metal and steel was introduced, got boring. But this is the pinnacle of wooden shipbuilding, it seems. Like pure wood, sails, no other crap, and just the amount of information over centuries gathered and, and stacked on to, to produce this kind of, of, of ship it is just so cool. Okay. Victory was not completed in time to take part in the Seven Years' War. She first saw action 13 years later in the American War of Independence, leading the capture of a French convoy off Ushant. When the Revolutionary Wars broke out against France, HMS Victory was the British flagship at the Allied blockade of Toulon. Then, in 1797, she was Admiral Jarvis's flagship at his great victory over the Spanish at Cape St. Vincent. Victory was by then 32 years old, far beyond her life expectancy of 18 years. Worn out, she was briefly threatened with being turned into one of Britain's notorious prison ships, known as Hulks. No one would have guessed that her greatest hour still lay ahead of her. Because at the last minute, Victory was reprieved and began a major three-year refit that cost more than she did to build. She returned to service in 1803 as Vice Admiral Nelson's flagship. Two years later, she would lead the British attack at Trafalgar and win her place in naval legend.
By the Napoleonic Wars, a first-rate ship of the line was the world's largest and most sophisticated weapon of war, and it needed a huge crew to work efficiently. In 1805, Victory's complement was around 820, every man and boy with his designated role. From the Admiral of the fleet to the ship's captain, naval lieutenants and marine officers, midshipmen, warrant officers, clerks and stewards, petty officers and their mates, sailors of the able, ordinary and landlubber variety, Royal Marines, right down to the 31 ship's boys. Before we examine HMS Seaman ship's boys, before we examine HMS Victory's arrangement and structure, a quick reminder of some common nautical terms. The right side of the ship, star Damn. starboard. Bow the stern. left side of the ship, larboard, port. which only became port in 1844 uh -oh. to reduce confusion. The back of the ship, her stern. The front, her stem. Towards Bow. the stern was aft or abaft. Towards the stem was forward or fore. Victory's middle gun deck was 186 feet long. The top of her main mast was 205 feet above the waterline. Victory's top speed was 10 knots or 11.5 miles per hour, fast for a ship her size. In 1780, she received the latest British naval innovation copper sheathing for her. That's pretty good. That's like a really fast jog. She received the latest British naval innovation, copper sheathing for her hull. This protected her timbers from shipworm, barnacles and weeds, keeping her solid and streamlined. Victory, like all ships of the line, was ship rigged, meaning she had three masts, a foremast, main mast and mizzen mast and a bowsprit. Each mast was made up of sections. The lower mast, secured deep in the ship's hold, rose up through the decks to the fighting top, which served as a platform for sharpshooters in battle. Listen, I'm going back, okay? Uh, go ahead if you want. Go forward. The back of the ship, her stern. The front, her stem. Towards the stern was aft or abaft. Towards the stem was forward or fore. Victory's middle gun deck was 186 feet long. The top of her main mast was 205 feet above the waterline. Victory's top speed was 10 knots or 11.5 miles per hour, fast for a ship her size. In 1780, she received the latest British naval innovation, copper sheathing for her hull. This protected her timbers from shipworm, barnacles and weeds, keeping her solid and streamlined. Victory, like all ships of the line, was ship rigged, meaning she had three masts, a foremast, main mast and mizzen mast and a bowsprit. Each mast was made up of sections. The lower mast, secured deep in the ship's hold, rose up through the decks to the fighting top which served as a platform for sharpshooters in battle. Above it, the topmast. Then the cross trees, which secured the top gallant mast, pronounced to gallant. The cross trees was the lookout's position, there being no crow's nests in the Navy. Each mast supported several yards to which the sails were fastened or bent. Victory's why no crow's nest? I, I wonder. Rigging 26 miles of sand or bent. Victory yards to which the sails were fastened or bent. Victory's rigging 26 miles of rope and 786 pulleys in all came in two types. Standing rigging gave structural support to the masts. Forestays and backstays kept them braced fore and aft. The shrouds secured the masts laterally, and their rope steps, called ratlins, were how you climbed the masts. Experienced seamen reached the tops by climbing the futtock shrouds. On a rolling sea, this could mean climbing out over the ocean upside down. So novices were advised to use the lubber's hole. 
The other type of rigging was running rigging, used to operate the ship's yards and sails, and included halyards, bowlines, and clue lines. Victory had 37 sails with which to harness the power of the wind, her only real form of propulsion. They had a total area of 6,500 square yards, about the size of a football pitch, though not all sails could be set together, nor did more sail necessarily mean more speed. Her large square sails included the four course, four top sail, pronounced topsail, and four top gallant sail, pronounced fortigarnsail. On the main mast, the main course, main topsail, and main togarnsail. The mizzen mast carried a fore and aft rigged sail known as a spanker or driver, as well as mizzen topsail and mizzen togarnsail, while the bowsprit could carry a variety of fore and aft rigged sails, most commonly a jib and flying jib. Another yeah. 11 fore and aft rigged sails, known as staysails, could also be set. Victory's upper deck, or weather deck, was actually several decks. The foc'sle, waist, quarter deck, and poop deck. Poop deck. The foc'sle is a shortened form of forecastle, a term dating back to the Middle Ages, when warships carried raised fighting platforms at both ends. The foc'sle housed the belfry, containing the all-important ship's bell, rung regularly day and night to mark the change of watch. It also housed two 12-pounder guns. All guns in this period were described by the weight of shot they fired. So 12-pounders fired a solid iron ball, known as round shot, that weighed 12 pounds, about the same as a bowling ball. The foc'sle also mounted two 68-pounder carronades. The carronade was another British innovation, a short, large-caliber gun, fearsome at close quarters, but lacking a cannon's range or accuracy. Do they have any buckshot things, like a shotgun? Buck, uh, the beak deck gave or, access... Or, or those shots that... Are, are those just in movies, or did they really have the ones where it was two balls connected by a chain, so when it shot out, it was like a woof, woof, which is just like uh, uh, a tor like a to the bowsprit tor part there. and the head. Six outdoor toilets for several hundred seamen and marines, which emptied straight into the sea below. I'm such a freaking child. Okay, sorry. And the head. Six outdoor toilets for several hundred seamen and marines, which emptied straight into the sea below. The waste is where four of Victory's six boats were stowed. All large ships carried several boats. They were essential for ferrying men and supplies from ship to ship and ship to shore, for towing or turning the ship in adverse winds, and for launching amphibious attacks. So they weren't the quarter deck was HMS Victory's command center and housed a total of 12 12 pounder guns. From I guess why waste space on lifeboats when you're going into war? Likely you're not going to have time to. Yeah. Here, center and housed a total of 12 12 pounder guns. From here, the ship was steered using the ship's wheel. This was the responsibility of one of the ship's eight quartermasters, assisted by his mates. The ship's wheel was connected by rope to the tiller three decks below, which was in turn connected to the rudder. The binnacle, just four of the wheel, contained the ship's magnetic compasses and a lantern by which to see them. Cabins for the captain's secretary and the ship's master were located either side of the ship's wheel. Each shared their small room with a 12-pounder gun. The stern area of the quarter deck comprised the captain's cabins, a dining room, sleeping cabin, and at the very stern of the ship, his day cabin, all sharing space with four 12-pounders. What? The captain also had a private toilet, known as the quarter gallery. Yeah, Above. it would be a bit, uh, like, you know, for the, 
You know, you remember uh, a, a commander? Uh, what's that one with Russell Crowe? Commander, Cap, Cap, Commander. The, the the movie with Russell Crowe and and uh, it based like during the the arc of uh, the Napoleonic Wars, Master and Commander. Um, met, like one of the upper kind of people started singing a song with that the lower people that sounds kind of bad when i say it but you know what i mean uh like the crew and then everyone stopped and was weird and it was because you're you're not expected to like fraternize in order to keep a level of um separation between ranks just to keep authority that makes sense and so just never seeing the captain come out to take a crap would have been like a it, it just it makes sense it Enough about the captain's crap. cabins, the poop deck, which provided good visibility That's where I would and go. access to the mizzen mast. It also housed the signal locker, containing the colored flags used to communicate with other ships and shore. The Royal Navy. Guys, so the poop deck is right below the. Uh, that, that was a bad joke. Never mind. Communicate with other ships and shore. The Royal Navy's signals code had been recently revised by Admiral Howe. His system involved 14 flags, which could be arranged in various combinations to convey 340 messages. For emphasis... They all look like, isn't that the Finnish flag right there? Eh. Yes, yeah. a gun might be fired. Messages. For emphasis, a gun might be fired. At night, signaling was by pre-agreed combinations of gunfire, colored lanterns, and rockets. A Napoleonic ship of the line was in I asked this in another video. Did... Was Morse code never a thing? Or, you know, like, when you're, like, blinking a light, like, blink, 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 and, like, to give a message? Did they ever do that with like putting a like a board of wood in front of a of a fire and just like kind of doing the same thing? A Napoleonic ship of the line that was anchor. in essence a giant floating gun battery designed to pulverize enemy warships and shore installations. Victory's three largest decks were all about her guns, as indicated by their name, the upper, middle, and lower gun deck. The upper gun deck housed 30 12-pounder guns, 15 on each side. Forward in the round houses was the head for junior officers, rank bringing slightly more privacy and comfort. Is a junior officer not necessarily like a young person? It's just someone below an officer? The sick bay was located in the forward area of the upper gun deck, as it got more fresh air and sunlight than the lower decks. It was screened off from the rest of the deck by canvas partitions. The surgeon's assistants, nicknamed Lob Lolly Boys for the soup they fed to patients, also slept here in their hammocks. That looks so comfy. HMS Victory was a first-rate ship of the line, defined as one that carried 100 guns or more. They were the most powerful vessels afloat, and so admirals often chose them as their flagships, the command vessels for a fleet or squadron. Several renowned British admirals took Victory as their flagship at various times. Why would you want your flagship to be the most powerful ship? Because you're never really going to be alone, right? And don't you want the more powerful ships to be the ones that are going to be doing most of the fighting? And a flagship, is shouldn't it just be there for command? I'm not saying you shouldn't have any guns. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to learn here. Several renowned British admirals took victory as their flagship at various times. Several renowned British admirals took victory as their flagship at various times, Lost including Earl Howe and Earl St. Vincent. 
The most famous, of course, was Viscount Nelson. Right, no arm. An admiral required his own suitably grand quarters. Look at like a dining room right there. What are those things? Oh, that's a cannon. What is that? It almost seems empty right there. Okay. Rooms, rooms. Uh, storage on the lower decks. So where's the water line? Oh, like right here. So this is the only... Located in the stern section of the upper... Yeah, look how... Look how the mast goes all the way through to the bottom. That makes sense. And then this one. This one even has like its own, yeah. Gun deck. Okay, sorry. Grand quarters, located in the stern section of the upper gun deck. These comprised an anteroom and a dining room, which also served as a meeting room. War room. In the sleeping cabin, the Admiral usually slept in a suspended cot. But Nelson preferred a campaign bed like this one, easier to get in and out of with only one arm. Man, that looks the... way too soft, though. That my back would be killing. Easier to get in and out of with only one arm. I, I like a very firm ma mattress, N not like a rock hard floor, but. Yeah. At the very stern lay the admiral's day cabin, which served as his office and private space. The Admiral would spend much of his day here, submerged in the meetings, paperwork, and administration required in the running of a fleet. When did he lose his arm? The Admiral's cabins, like all cabins on the gun decks and quarter deck, were formed by removable wooden panels. This meant when a ship cleared for action before battle, the cabins could be rapidly dismantled and carried with furniture and personal items down into the hold. Does anyone know what these things are? Can you see, you can see my cursor, right? Right to the, if you can't, right to the left of the clearing for action. You, you can see it. Uh, what are those? And why is there no storage? The purpose of this was to allow the gun crews to work their guns without obstruction. The middle I, I missed that point. I paused in the middle. Jesus. Cabins could be rapidly dismantled and carried with furniture and personal items down into the hold. The purpose of this was to allow the gun crews to work their guns without obstruction. The middle gun deck housed 28 24 pounder guns. The middle gun deck housed 28 24 pounder guns. Ooh. Heavier guns were lower in the ship for greater stability. Makes sense. The ship's galley, a kitchen and giant iron stove, was where the ship's cook and his mates prepared meals for the crew. The stern section was known as the wardroom, where commissioned officers dined and slept. At night, around 300 sailors and marines slept on this deck. Their hammocks strung up between the guns. The deck below was the lower. I really, I gotta pee, guys. Be right back. Okay, go. I washed my hands. Lower gun deck and the guns. The deck below was the lower gun deck. This housed the Victory's heaviest guns, her 30, 32 pounders. And at night, more than half the crew, around 460 men, slept here. This plan of HMS Bedford, a contemporary third-rate ship of the line, shows how crowded it could be below decks. This far down in the ship, gun ports were usually kept shut because they were close to the waterline. With little fresh air and so many men living down here, oh. the smells of the... The smell. Uh. And there are, gun there are a bunch of men who uh, have not seen women for a long time and are probably... ...could be notoriously challenging. The stern area, no. separated by canvas screens, was known as the gun room. 
This was where warrant officers dined, with screened-off sleeping quarters for the master gunner, chaplain, and two junior lieutenants. They shared the gun room with the ship's tiller, a large wooden beam connecting the ship's rudder to the ship's wheel via a series of ropes and pulleys. The tiller is not currently in situ, but the strip of canvas marks its position. The beam would swing through the room when the ship turned, so anyone dining in the gun room was wise to mind their head. Below the lower gun deck was the orlop deck. A wa I wonder if anyone like died from that or something. I, I don't know how fast. Warren of small cabins and stores begun deck was the orlop deck. A warren of small cabins and stores beneath the waterline, lit only by lanterns. The forward section contained storerooms and cabins for the bosun and carpenter. The more open area by the main mast was known as the cockpit, fore and aft. The midshipmen berthed and messed here, but in battle it became the surgeon's operating theatre. At the Battle of Trafalgar, after Vice Admiral Nelson... Did they have any sort of anesthetic, or not anesthetic, um, anesthesia or pain killing, like opium or something like that, or did they just get them drunk if they had to amputate? ...was shot on the... At the Battle of Trafalgar, after Vice Admiral Nelson was shot on the quarterdeck by a French sharpshooter, he was carried down to the Orlop. Victory's surgeon was unable to save him. And this is where he died. Off the aft cockpit lay a series of cramped compartments, including personal storerooms for the captain and first lieutenant, the steward's room for issuing rations brought up from the hold, the surgeon's cabin and his dispensary, and various other cabins and storerooms. Forward and aft, hanging magazines held ready-made cartridges for the guns sent up from the main magazine. The Orlop deck was surrounded by a passage known as the Carpenter's Walk, which gave the carpenter and his mates easy access to the ship's hull to plug any leaks. At the very bottom of the ship lay the hold. Dang, did he didn't explain what I... I really hope I didn't miss if he explained what I asked. I don't think he did. Around 50,000 cubic feet, holding provisions for up to six months at sea. It was lined with 257 tons of iron ballast to keep the ship stable. This was covered by 200 tons of shingle, additional ballast, which provided a stable bed for the ship's 150 gallon water casks. These alone weighed roughly 300 tons at the start of a voyage. Other barrels contained 50 tons of salt beef, 50 tons of salt pork, and 45 tons of ship's biscuit. Various storerooms below contained items such as flour, spirits, tar, and paint. The shot locker contained 100 tons of iron shot. Last but not least, the most vulnerable part of the ship, the Grand Magazine holding up to 35 tons of gunpowder in seven... Keep that under the water line. 184 barrels. A fire here would cause an explosion that obliterated the ship and anyone aboard. Or if water got in, the gunpowder would be useless in battle. Therefore, elaborate precautions were taken to keep the magazine safe, including fire doors, fire retardant plaster walls, copper sheathing to avoid sparks, and keep out moisture and rats. The forward section of the magazine was the filling room. Here, loose gunpowder was scooped from this powder bin into cloth bags to make cartridges for the guns. Lanterns were kept safely behind glass in an adjacent light room. Until required, ready cartridges were stored in racks on either side of the filling room. In an age before recent so I don't know how protective it is, but I wonder if they had like buckets of water kind of covered 
within that room just in case a fire started behind the glass to quickly put it out just because it's so close to the ammunition. Light room. Until required, ready cartridges were stored in racks on either side of the filling room. In an age before steam or electrical power, all the ship's heavy lifting had to be done by manpower. Mechanical assistance came from two capstans, the main capstan and gear capstan. These were effectively giant winches, which extended vertically through the middle and lower gun decks. To turn them, bars were inserted into the capstan head, with up to 10 men pushing each bar. Whoa. Using both decks, this meant 260 men were working the capstan for the heaviest jobs, such as raising the main anchor or hoisting a gun. The work was often accompanied by a fiddler, a shanty, and the stamp of feet. So obviously, if you're pushing here, you're going to be doing much less force than pushing here. Like, I'd imagine this guy in the end is probably just because of how levers work, right? Just, like, is probably doing as much work as, like, the first three guys or something. But I, I, I'm not saying, you know, you can't, it's better to have them there than no one there. I, Victory carried seven anchors in total. Jesus. The heaviest, Why? the best power anchor, weighed four tons and was rigged at the starboard bow. The small power anchor on the larboard side was only slightly smaller. Sheet, kedge, and stream anchors served as spares and for keeping the ship stationary in small harbors or rough weather. All wooden ships leak at sea even before hulls are split by cannonballs or hidden reefs. Victory had four crank-operated chain pumps, That's which cool. could pump water out of the ship at approximately 1,300 gallons per minute, about 300 jerry cans worth. What's the jerry also can? Had two elm What's pumps the jerry for pumping seawater into the ship for washing and putting out fires. In the late 18th century, HMS Victory and ships like her were the most sophisticated and advanced machines in the world. Massive floating batteries that could remain at sea for six months or more and traverse the globe. In the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, they battled for naval supremacy, most dramatically in giant fleet actions. It was a contest that Britain won decisively. The consequences for Napoleon were disastrous. But for all victory's qualities, it was not ship design that gave Britain the edge in the war at sea. It was the men who sailed her. I was just about to say, are they just better sailors? British commanders and crews were experienced, capable, and aggressive. In the next video, we'll see how they sailed and fought a ship like Victory, and how they lived aboard her. That was fast. I know I love a video, I loved video when it flies by. Our deep thanks to the National Museum of the Royal Navy and HMS Victory for their help in making this series. Victory is now embarking thanks, on an exciting new phase of her long and dramatic history a major 10-year conservation project to ensure her survival far into the future. The work is guided by the latest scientific and historical research and will involve removing and replacing rotting timber and other structural repair. What about that, th that saying or that riddle or whatever? Like if you replace every board of a ship, is it the same ship? You know? Yes. And the great news is that the ship remains fully open to visitors throughout. I'm going. Visit during the project, and you'll even get to see conservation work up close, with expert shipwrights on hand to explain what's happening. For more information and bookings, please visit historicdockyard.co.uk.
Thank you to all our Patreon members for supporting Epic History TV and making videos like this possible. Thanks, guys. If you'd like to support our work, get exclusive updates, and add free early access to new videos, please visit our Patreon page. You should support their work. I've watched so many of their videos. Awesome. That was a good one, too. 1848. Love it. Love it. Everything about it. British Navy, Trafalgar, I mean, British Navy, it was Admiral Nelson's ship was during the Napoleonic Wars. I'm incredibly interested in evolving ship technology, not just ships, just mainly ships. Guns and stuff too, though. Awesome video. I hope you guys enjoyed that, learned something, or can teach me something. I am wondering, it's probably something just not a big deal, but I am wondering what that guns what this room over here is with those things maybe it's just nothing awesome blossom extra awesome hope you guys are doing well if not chin up you're gonna be fine emotions are fickle my friend and uh yeah hope you enjoyed that as much as i did see you guys next time all right bye for uh part two see ya